how do women select their mates? Now, unlike female chimps, female humans are choosy maters. Female chimps will mate with any chimp. They go into heat, they'll mate with any chimp. The dominant males are more likely to mate with them, but that's because they chase away the subordinates. It's not because the females exercise choice. Human females exercise choice. And that's one of the things that differentiated us from chimpanzees. But how do they do it? Well, they look at the male dominance hierarchy. And that's where the men are competing. Now, you could say they're competing for power, but that's a pretty corrupt way of looking at it. Like, they're competing for, let's say, influence. They're competing for leadership. And so, in some sense, the people at the top of the hierarchy, if their men are elected by the other men, now I know there's brutes and there's predators and all of that, but I'm talking on average across time. It's like the men organize themselves and there are influential men that rise to the top and the women take them. Now you think about that. What that means is that over the millions of years that a dominance hierarchy with those properties existed, so let's say since we split from chimps, let's say that's six million years, that means that the male dominance hierarchy is the environment that pushes the mating male to the top. So that means the male that's most likely to take precedence in the, dom in the male dominance hierarchy is the one most likely to leave a genetic contribution. So that means that the male dominance hierarchy is a selection mechanism mediated by the female. So what that means is that as we've moved forward through six million years of time, men have become more and more well adapted not only to the presence of the male dominance hierarchy but to the ability to move up it and that's the central spirit you could say in some sense that's the central spirit of the individual the individual is the thing that can move up dominance hierarchies it's the thing that's at the top it's the eye at the top of the pyramid and it's been selected for and then what's happened is that we've watched so we get better and better and better for biological reasons culturally mediated at figuring out how to climb across a set of dominance hierarchies so we can leave a genetic contribution. That's what's happened to human beings. Now imagine that that's happened for six million years. So now imagine that we started to watch that because we're curious creatures. We're always trying to figure out who we are. And then as we watched that, we started to tell stories about what the people who could climb the hierarchies were like. Those were heroes. That's where hero mythology came from. And the biggest hero is the person who go out and kill the snake. Well, unsurprisingly, because that was a big hero, man. And maybe when we were living in trees, that was a hero. So the, the big hero is the person who goes out, slays the dragon, gets the gold, brings it back to the community and distributes it. He's also the person most likely to go up the dominance hierarchy. He's the person most likely to find the virgin, right? Because it's a virgin that you free from the dragon and you get to claim her, right? And so the dominance hierarchy is a mechanism that selects heroes and then breeds them. And so then we watch that for six million years. We start to understand what it means to be the hero. We start to tell stories about that. And so then not only are we genetically aiming at that with the dominance hierarchy as a selection mechanism mediated by female choice, but our stories are trying to push us in that direction. And so then we say, well, look, that person's admirable tell a story about him and we say this person is admirable tell a story about him and this person is admirable and at the same time we talk about the people who aren't admirable and then we start having admirable and non-admirable as categories and out of that you get something like good and evil and then you can start to imagine the perfect person that would be not only so it would be you take 10 admirable people and you pull out someone who's meta admirable and that's a hero that becomes a religious figure across time that becomes a savior, a messiah across time as we conceptualize what the ideal person is. And, we, and in the West, here's how we figured it out. We said the ideal person, the ideal man is the person who tells the truth. And what that means is that's the best way of climbing up any possible dominance hierarchy in the, in the way that's most stable and most lasting. That's, that's the conclusion of Western culture.